Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The passage we'll talk about this morning is the Gospel from the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Dear friends in Christ, Merry Christmas. What a wonderful day it is, and what a wonderful place to be on Christmas morning right here in God's church, in the Lord's own house. Doesn't everybody just love Christmas? Some people love Christmas for different reasons than others, though. I did a devotion for a group of 33 and 4-year-olds at daycare on Thursday, and I asked the kids, Who's coming on Christmas? And you know the answer. All 30 of them, as loud as they could, and in unison said, Santa! Thankfully, though, this was a Christian daycare, so then I asked him, well, whose birthday is it on Christmas? And again, this time they all yelled loudly and in unison, Jesus! while celebrating the season with the giving of gifts inspired by St. Nicholas is totally fine. Of course, as we knew, knew from last night's service, the heart of Christmas, the real reason we come here on Christmas Eve and again today on Christmas morning is to celebrate again the wonder of the birth of our Lord, the wonder of the birth of the Son of God come in human flesh. And it's certainly easy to tell in so many ways that it is Christmas. You see it in the, our own homes, in our neighborhoods, and in virtually every store with all the decorations that have actually been out in stores for quite some time. And we see it, and you cannot miss it whatsoever, right here at St. Peter's. You can't miss it in church, because most importantly, we have the beautiful creche in front of the altar, setting the symbolic scene of the stable, the animals, Mary and Joseph, and above all, the Christ child, lying peacefully in his humanity in a manger, and surely in his divinity, already knowing his, eternal, his destiny of suffering, death, and resurrection on behalf of all of us. Then again, you also can't miss the fact that it's Christmas because there are four big, beautiful trees on the sides of the altar. There are wreaths and banners and special lighting as well. It's also pretty easy to tell that it's Christmas by how many people dress for the season in Christmas sweaters, Christmas ties, a lot of red, a lot of green. In a lot of cases, we want to wear our best or at least to look Christmassy because we want to fit in for Christmas. We want everyone to know what season it is. And especially, we want to honor the Lord. We want to honor the celebration of Jesus' birth we want to be a part of it all, and that's great. Now, last night, those of us who were here heard once again the familiar, wonderful story of Jesus' birth in the traditional Christmas Eve gospel from the second chapter of Luke. And Luke the physician and Luke the historian gave us the details about the birth of Jesus, setting the scene for us on a very grand scale telling us that it all happened in the days when Caesar Augustus was emperor of the whole Roman Empire and Quirinius was governor of Syria. And Caesar decreed that a census should be taken of the Roman Empire, causing Joseph and pregnant Mary to have to travel to Bethlehem at just the right time so that the Lord's birth would take place in fulfillment of the ancient words of the prophets. And Luke tells us how it all happened. But today, on Christmas morning, the focus of the gospel is not quite the same. First of all, we shift 
from that traditional Christmas story in Luke's gospel to the gospel according to St. John. And second, when you read in John's gospel about the coming of the Son of God into the world, John's approach is entirely different because where Luke tells us details about the history and how it all happened in time, John actually describes for us the meaning, the cosmic theological importance of the birth and ministry of God's only begotten son, Jesus. And John sets the stage for us by connecting the birth of Jesus to the birth of the world at the moment of creation. And let's read these words together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. In those four sentences, John lets us know that when God said, let there be light, in Genesis 1, that word that came out of his mouth was more than just sound. That word was a living, divine person. That word was the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. And while God the Father is the one that we always associate with creating the world, especially as we read the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, John tells us the full truth, that without the Word, without the Son of God, nothing at all would have existed. In truth, without that Word, we would have nothing, we wouldn't be here at all. And in John's logic then, as we move to the more relevant part of his Gospel, it only makes sense that the same word who brought about the creation of everything would also be the one who would come to recreate our world and to recreate all humanity, which had fallen under the curse of sin and death. Now, Luke's account of the Christmas story is easy to understand because, again, he just tells the story as it happened. But John's account is a little tougher. It takes some thinking for us to understand. But of course, it is well worth our effort. And the key verse in those 18 verses of the gospel that were read is John 1, verse 14. And let's read this together. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. When you boil it down, you can see what is happening there. While we dress up to come to church on Christmas, while we dress to fit in to celebrate the birth of the Lord, the Son of God actually dressed down so that he could fit in with you and me and with all of humanity. In fact, he dressed down so much that he became like us human beings in every way, in physical makeup, in becoming part of an average human family, in being part of a typical small community immersed in the culture and the religious practices of his country. He was so much a human being that in a crowd, you couldn't tell that he was the eternal son of God, in this crowd, you can see that people are honoring him, but he's a human being, just like everybody else on that slide. And as a human being, the Son of God even faced the same temptations that each and every one of us are prone to. So he totally fit in with us in every way except one. Unlike us, he was not guilty of falling to temptation. He was never guilty of any sin whatsoever. Never guilty of any breaking of God's law. 
and as the Son of God who came to recreate us, he lived that obedient life from the moment of his birth until his suffering and death. And then he gave you and me and all humanity the credit for everything that he had done. And of course, not only that, but we know especially that Jesus, the Son of God, came to identify with us so much that he even suffered and died, as all of us will. He died, even though he didn't have to. He chose to die. He chose to take the punishment that all of us deserve for our sins. And the writer to Hebrews in the second chapter of that letter describes it so well where it's written, and let's read these words together. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in our humanity. He himself suffered when he was tempted, so he is able to help those who are being tempted. He shared our humanity so that by his death he might free those who all their lives have been held in slavery by their fear of death. How great is that? Jesus, the Son of God, dressed down not only on the first Christmas, but he dressed down all his life to fit in with us so he completely understands everything that you and I go through. He understands everything that we experience. And his gift to us always is that he loves us, warts and all. He forgives us. He has overcome our worst enemy of death itself by actually rising physically from the grave with the promise that as we simply entrust our lives to him by faith, we know that we too will rise from the dead and live forever. 700 years before Christ was born, God the Father foretold Jesus' greatest gift to us through the words of the prophet in Isaiah 53. And let's read these words together. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a wonderful, what a masterful word picture of the forgiveness of our sins that is already ours through Jesus that God the Father has given to us in his Son. That is an incredible reason for us to celebrate. And that has to be especially meaningful to any of us who have lost loved ones in the last year to realize that the hurt, the sting, the pain of loss and separation is only temporary. Because as John 1 says, and let's read these words again together, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And in John 11, later on, Jesus himself makes the point of his ministry crystal clear to all, where he said, and let's read this together, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So, what a joy it is for us to be here today, dressed up to celebrate Christmas in this marvelously decorated church. But even greater than that, how wonderful is it to realize that by his birth as the babe of Bethlehem, Jesus dressed down to identify with you and me in every way and to give us the greatest gifts 
of forgiveness and new and eternal life. So we all surely have great reason to say Merry Christmas. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.